Welcome to Stats Next. Today's presentation is titled, What's the Difference Between an Equivalence Test and a Difference Test? Please welcome back today's presenter, Dr. Rick Burdick. Dr. Burdick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stacy. Our goals and objectives today are to teach you the difference between what's called an equivalence test of means and a difference test of means, and then look at some typical applications in the CMC manufacturing world where we perform equivalence tests. So we're going to start with an example today, which is qualification of a reference standard. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, just a few details. So in the analytical lab, we use reference standard for a variety of assays. And in this particular example, we're using it for a potency assay. And this material is starting to run out. And so what we need to do is develop a new batch of material and replace the, uh, the reference standard with this new material. Now, one of the problems uh, with a potency assay is because all of the measurements that we make are relative to the reference standard, we need the new reference standard to be very close to the previous reference standard. Or in particular, we want the candidate reference standard to have a value of 100% or close to 100% relative to the present reference standard. So the question that we have uh, for the statistical test is, how can we demonstrate that a new candidate reference standard is sufficiently close to the present reference standard? That is sufficiently close to 100%. And there are a couple of different ways that folks have approached this. The first one I'm gonna talk about is what's called the difference test. So in the difference test, we're gonna conduct a hypothesis test as shown in the upper left part of my slide here where the null hypothesis says that the average of the new relative, excuse me, of the new reference standard relative to the present reference standard is equal to 100%. And the alternative says it's something different than 100%. So in probably the first statistics course you ever took, this was the kind of hypothesis test that you were introduced to. It's called a difference test because the alternative just says the true value is different than the value hypothesized in the null, which is 100. Now, if someone uses this difference test to perform our uh, qualification of the reference standard, they use the following decision rule. They say that if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, that is, if we get a high p-value, then we can declare that the lot is sufficiently close to 100%. In this context, a high p-value is defined as any value greater than 0.05. So if you look to the uh, output that I have on the right-hand side of the screen here, you'll see the statistical test here, where we took uh, a sample of 10 measurements of the uh, new reference standard against the old. We calculated the value of the average, which is 100.95. We tested against the hypothesized value of 100, and we observed the following T score that's circled here, P score that's circled here, 0.4554, which is greater than our threshold of 0.05. So what this says is we don't have sufficient data to reject the null hypothesis. There isn't strong evidence that the value is different from 100. And so using this approach to the qualification standard, uh, a researcher might conclude then the value is sufficiently close to 100 because I could not reject this null. And they would claim that the new reference standard can replace the old reference standard. The fallacy of this kind of test though is the following. As I've noted at the bottom, the absence of evidence is never evidence of absence, which sounds a little confusing, but what am I saying here? What I'm saying here is in your typical hypothesis test here, what we're willing to believe is the null hypothesis unless we have evidence of the alternative. So in any hypothesis situation, what we're attempting to do is prove the alternative. In other words, find evidence that tells you the alternative is the true state of nature. 
When I say the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, what I'm saying is if you're unable to reject the null because there's an absence of evidence, that is, there's no evidence that the true value is not 100, that is not proof that the null hypothesis is true. That is not evidence of absence, absence being the null. You may have heard it said another way that you can never prove a null hypothesis. Statistical proof and evidence only supports the alternative. So the question is, if this isn't the proper way to actually demonstrate that we've got uh, a reference standard that is close enough to 100%, how might one do it? And the way we do it is with an equivalence test. So as I mentioned, the problem with the difference test is the hypotheses aren't set up in such a way that the alternative states what we'd like to show. So in an equivalence test here, my hypothesis says exactly what I'm trying to demonstrate in my experiment. Namely, the average of the new relative standard is between 95 and 105%. So here I've put numbers to the term that I called sufficiently close. Sufficiently close means that the true value of my new reference standard relative to the original reference standard is between 95 and 105. This comes from subject matter experts. It comes from understanding the process. It comes from understanding the analytical intermediate precision of the method. So what I'm saying is this number, this range 95 to 105 comes from scientific considerations. The alternative hypothesis then is again now what I need to show, as opposed to the null that says the opposite case, namely that the true value is either less than 95 or greater than 105%. So we set up the hypotheses in an appropriate way where I'm looking for evidence to demonstrate that my claim is true, namely, that my new reference standard has a true value between 95 and 105 percent. The way we test it is quite simple then. We take our sample and we calculate a confidence interval. We've talked about these before in the stat stacks. A confidence interval is to where the true value lies. We then compare this confidence interval to the range in the alternative. In this case, my sample gave me a confidence interval from 98.7% to 103%. If this is my range of plausible values and all of these values fall between 95 and 105, I have provided statistical proof that the true values between 98.7 and 103 with a given level of confidence and since they fall within the range, I can now claim that we have qualified the reference standard. Just one other point that comes up and often causes confusion in these equivalence tests. You notice that on the output here, it says I did 90% two-sided confidence intervals. And you may be more familiar with using 95% confidence intervals to make decisions. Well, it turns out in this equivalence test here, because I have to satisfy both a lower range and an upper range of my alternative hypothesis, that we conduct what's called two one-sided tests, a toast. And by calculating a 90% two-sided interval, we actually do have a type one error rate of 5%, which is what the typical uh, norm is for such a test. Okay, so let's kind of summarize the two tests here. The difference test, the conclusion would be stated as the difference between the average potency of the new, relative, uh, the new reference standard relative to the present is not statistically significant, and then you would give a p-value. The equivalence test says the difference between the average potency of the new reference standard relative to the present reference standard is no greater than 5% away from the desired 100% target with a type one error rate of 5%. Which of these two conclusions do you find most useful, most informative, and most satisfying? And hopefully you would say the equivalence test.
The equivalence test truly addresses the question that we have as researchers, as opposed to a difference test that merely proclaims whether we have a statistically significant difference or not. Investigators often incorrectly assume that fail to reject the null in a difference test is evidence of being sufficiently close. Again, you can't assume that an absence of evidence is evidence of an absence. A report of statistical significance or lack thereof should never be one that implies, necessarily implies important. And it never informs us of the practical impact of the result. So contrasted to the difference test, the equivalence test always considers practical importance and is the test that you need to demonstrate the groups of items such as reference lots, manufacturing processes, analytical procedures are sufficiently close to each other. Finally, I've got a few applications here of equivalence tests that you may become familiar with in the industry. Uh, the first one is an analytical method transfer where we send an analytical method from one lab to the other. And one of the questions that we need to determine is whether the bias is sufficiently small between the two labs. And so a question that you might ask is something like the following, is the bias of a UV scan between a sending lab and a receiving lab less than two units? And so you would set this up as an equivalence test. Again, the criteria would be show that the absolute value of the bias is less than two. That would be your alternative hypothesis and you perform a test of equivalence. Another recent uh, application of equivalence test concerns bioassays and the system and sample suitability criteria that you use there that uh, has historically be called, been called a parallelism, a parallelism test. Uh, material on these use of equivalence tests can be found in section 47 of USP 1032. But the equivalence test is to look at some of the parameters of your 4PL curve, such as the slope or the asymptotes and test equivalence between your reference and your test sample of those particular parameters. What many people have used in the past were called goodness of fit tests, chi-squared or F tests. These are actually forms of the difference test. So again, the whole notion of those is a bit like the uh, difference test. And then what you're doing is performing a test, hoping not to see a difference and then concluding that they're the same, which again is kind of the mind frame that we want to get out of. Third example, used a lot in process characterization or scale up comparisons, where the means of small scale unit operations are tested to see whether they're equivalent to means of larger scale unit operations. And another application uh, that I've worked on concerns product homogeneity assessment, demonstrating that your drug product material is the same from first drop to last drop. One way you might do that is to conduct an experiment during fill of your drug product, sampling material from the beginning, the middle, and the end of the fill. And then what we want to determine is by performing an equivalence test, is the difference in the pairwise combination of these mean less than some particular quantity? And so the question that would be addressed and placed into the alternative hypothesis would be, that the average concentration has changed from beginning, middle to end. We don't see any change greater than some uh, number in this uh, particular case, two uh, mic micrograms per ml. And so you would again do, in this case, three pairwise uh, equivalence tests, beginning versus middle, beginning versus end, and middle versus end. So this is the end of our stat stacks today. Just to summarize, most statistical investigations uh, that are scientifically based and want to answer scientific questions are better performed using a test of equivalence than a difference test. This is because the equivalence test considers, again, the scientific importance 
of any difference that might exist. And if you'd like more details on this topic, you can check out Appendix 3 of USP 1010, which discusses statistical equivalence testing, as well as hypothesis testing in general.